Dr. Heather Zwicky is the professor of immunology at the National University um, of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Zwicky received her PhD from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. Her training at the world-renowned National Jewish Medical and Research Center in Denver prepared her to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University. Dr. Zwicky, Dr. Zwicky, I'm sorry, initiated the student research program at NUNM and serves as a mentor for student research projects. She enjoys mentoring postdoctoral fellows and junior investigators. In line, in line with mentoring the next generation of integrative medicine researchers, she has research experience examining the effects of botanicals, probiotics, energy medicine, and diet on immunology, immunological parameters in humans. Dr. Zwicky also explores the mechanisms involved in infectious disease, cancer, autoimmune disease, and immunological tolerance. She serves as the principal investigator of an NIH grant that increases research and evidence-based medicine in the curriculum at NUNM. Her long-term personal goal is to establish NUNM as one of the leading integrative medical research institutions in the United States. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me. I have done this before and you guys are such a good audience. So. I'm loving seeing all the places show up and how many of them I've lived in. Um, so uh, I lived in Brantford, Connecticut for a while when I was uh, teaching at Yale and I've lived in Colorado and I've lived in Minnesota. I grew up in Minnesota. So nice to see all of those places there. And I am now in Oregon and I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my slides and get us started. So. Last year, I did a presentation for this group and we talked about what to eat and what not to eat. But there's so much more that we could have talked about. So what we thought we would do this year is we thought we would add what to eat and what not to eat 2.0. So we're gonna take what we did last year and build on it. Now, first I'm gonna remind you that nutrition has major impacts on the brain. But the impacts on the brain are not just direct effects, they're actually coming from the gut. So we know that the happiness of the microbes that live in your gut are directly responsible for the health of your brain. And the reason for that, as it turns out, is that the microbes in the gut can produce neurotransmitters. So dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter that most people with Parkinson's are lacking, is not only produced in the brain, it is also produced in the gut. That means that if we take care of the gut with food, we can actually replace some of that dopamine that's missing in the brain. Now, one of the major mechanisms that is happening in the brain of people with Parkinson's is, is inflammation. And there's two major components of inflammation. The first component is oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, you've probably heard of as free radicals. When we think about free radicals, we think about the health of our skin and whether or not we're getting those laugh lines around our eyes and around our mouth. When, our, when we age and as our skin ages, the free radicals damage our skin and that's what causes aging of our skin. The problem is that if oxidative stress is happening in your brain, then it's doing damage to the brain tissue instead of doing damage to something relatively innocuous like our skin, where we may not look as nice as we want to, but we're still able to move normally. The other component of inflammation are cytokines. And there are three cytokines that we focus on. They are called interleukin-1 or IL-1, IL-6, interleukin-6, and TNF, which stands for tumor necrosis factor. It was discovered because it will kill cancer cells. 
So these cytokines are necessary if you are fighting an infection. So if you get COVID, you want to make these cytokines. They're going to help you fight an infection. But if you don't have an infection, then you don't want these cytokines. And one of the problems that we see is that if the microbes in your gut are unhappy, then they cause the production of these cytokines. And then we get inflammation in the brain. So our strategy when we approach food is that we want to increase food that's going to increase brain activity and neurogenesis. They're going to do things like increase the production of dopamine and serotonin and some of those neurotransmitters that make us happy and reduce inflammation. Our second strategy is to specifically reduce inflammation. And we're going to reduce inflammation with food. It'll affect inflammation throughout your entire body. So not just your brain, but it will also affect inflammation that you might be experiencing in your, in your joints or inflammation you might be experiencing uh, in your pancreas if you also have diabetes. And then we also want to decrease chemicals. And the decreased chemicals component turns out to be really important because it's the chemicals that are making the microbes in our gut unha unhappy. So one of the things that we've discovered over the last about seven years now is that things that kill off the microbes in our gut, things like pesticides and preservatives in our food, but also things like antibiotics are responsible for the imbalance and the unhappy microbes that we're experiencing in our gut. And that is one of the main contributors to Parkinson's disease. So decreasing chemicals is one of the things that we're going to do. So that means that we're going to eat foods that are good for the brain. We're going to eat foods that are anti-inflammatory, and we're going to eat foods that are are organic, so we have less pesticides, and fresh, so we have less preservatives, and that's to preserve those microbes. Now, what we talked about last year is we talked about not eating sweets, things like high fructose corn syrup and sugar and all of those things that may taste delicious, but that actually aren't all that good for those microbes in our gut. We talked about not eating foods that are inflammatory. And what I'm showing you a picture of there are foods that are canned. So one of the studies that we saw was a study that showed that people with Parkinson's who eat canned foods have a faster disease progression than people with Parkinson's who don't eat canned foods. We think that's because most canned foods are lined, most of those cans are lined with um, chemicals that are not good for the microbes in our gut. And then, uh, so I'll just elaborate on that one minute. Um, it used to be that our cans were lined with BPA and BPA is not a good chemical for us to be exposed to. In 2017, there was a huge outcry on the fact that BPA was in canned foods. And so they changed it. And now all of our cans are lined with vinyl. The problem is we don't know if vinyl is actually any healthier for us than BPA was. So the think about eating a vinyl um, toy, right? That, that doesn't sound very edible, does it? No. And so why do we want to eat food that has vinyl in it? We, we probably don't. So switching to frozen foods or fresh foods is much uh, better sources than um, canned foods. And then lastly, we want to get rid of chemicals. And that means getting rid of pesticides in our diet. So last year, we summarized what to eat here with eat berries, do you remember which berries are the best? The darker the color, the healthier the berry. So blackberries, then blueberries, then raspberries, then strawberries. We want to eat fish and especially fish oil. And we're going to talk about that more today. 
And then spices. It turns out that many of the spices that are out there are so medicinal for people with Parkinson's that they have entered the drug development pipeline. So making sure that we're cooking with spices is a good thing. We want to eat nuts. Nuts have both oils and proteins that are really good for our brain. So when I'm talking about brain food, most often I'm talking nuts and berries. Nuts and berries, you cannot go wrong. Green tea. There's studies that show that green tea can ward off the symptoms of Parkinson's for up to seven years. So three cups of green tea per day, super important. See if we can get that green tea into you. And then vegetables. The more colorful the vegetable, the better. And what to avoid? The first thing, artificial sweeteners. And a, a study just came out today, I, I think you'll probably, it'll hit the news tomorrow, showing that erythritol, not so good either. So get rid of your sweet and low, get rid of your equal, get rid of your Splenda, get rid of your erythritol. They're doing damage. They're artificial and our body doesn't know how to handle them and we don't detoxify them well. You can eat honey and maple syrup and do so much better for your body than the artificial sweeteners or monk fruit um, and stevia if you're uh, trying to lose weight. We also wanna get rid of trans fats. And trans fats, we often think of things like French fries, but we're not talking about French fries. I mean, not that French fries are good for you, but trans fats are the fats that we put in baked goods so that they have a long shelf life. So I'm thinking about things like cookies and little Debbie Swiss cake rolls, which I used to love, but no more, no trans fats. We wanna get rid of that high fructose corn, corn syrup because Number one, it's contaminated, it has mercury in it, and heavy metals are not good for our brain. And number two, it spikes our blood sugar. And anything that spikes our blood sugar increases the inflammation in our brain. So things that spike blood sugar get to go bye-bye. And then the last thing we talked about last year was dairy. And I know, I know you're ice cream fans. I'm an ice cream fan too, but we want to eat alternative ice creams. We want to eat ice cream made out of cashew milk, soy milk, rice milk, almond milk, any other type of milk, because dairy has pesticides in it, number one. And number two, it breaks down uric acid. I'm going to spell that for you so you know what it is. U-R-I-C, uric acid acid. Turns out uric acid is protective of the brain of people with Parkinson's, but dairy's breaking it down. So not only do you get the harm from the pesticides in the dairy, you get the additional double whammy of breaking down something that your body makes that's protective. So no dairy. Okay, so how are we going to improve upon this for what to eat 2.0. You've added your berries and your nuts and your green tea and your spices. Now what? And you've eliminated dairy and artificial sweeteners and high fructose corn syrup and trans fat. Now what? Let's talk about how to improve upon this. One of the things I mentioned last time that I want to re-mention this time is that there is really good evidence, there's now additional studies um, emphasizing this, that it doesn't matter what type of diet you have. It doesn't matter whether you're a vegetarian or you eat meat or you eat both meat and vegetables or you're vegan. What matters is that you're getting 30 plant-based foods per week. So the people who are healthiest, who are over here on the right side of this graph are the ones who are getting 30 plant-based foods per week. And your 30 plant-based foods per week can involve all sorts of different kinds of plants. It can be vegetables and spices. It's not 30 servings. It's the diversity of the plants that matter, not the quantity of the plants. So we really want to get a little bit of a lot of things instead of a lot of a few things. So if you're thinking, well, I'll just eat carrots and that'll be my source of vegetable, not good enough. You have to change up the plants that you're eating. Include some nuts, include some beans, include some spices, 
all of those various things. So what are the plant-based foods? They are vegetables and fruits for sure, but they're also beans and nuts and grains. Now, when I say that, a lot of people are like, oh, good, grains are there. I can eat my, my sandwich for lunch every day. And that counts as a plant-based food. Yes, but your plants, your plant-based foods should look like food. They shouldn't look like processed things. We actually want them to have the shape of food. So if you have taken the wheat and you have processed it down to a pasta, yes, it's still a plant-based food, but it's not the best plant-based food. We really want foods that look like food. Um, I had this experience when I went to Africa one year and I brought some students with me and one of the students had decided that she was afraid of African food. So she filled her suitcase with bars and she had all sorts of cliff bars and she had, you know, this type of bar and that type of bar, be kind bars and all of these bars. And the Africans looked at her and they were like, why are you eating that? That's not food. And you know, it seems so obvious in retrospect to say, oh yeah, no, that isn't food. That's processed food. Um, but we're so used to it in America because most of our grocery store is processed. I'm going to encourage you to shop around the outside of the grocery store. If you think about the grocery store and you go inside, the vegetables are on the outside wall, the grains, the meats, all of those things, they're on the outside of the grocery store. Once you start going up and down the aisles, now you're in your processed foods. So work on shopping around the outside of the grocery store. All right, you ready for your first quiz? So would you eat a potato or potato chips for a plant? They're both plant-based foods, right? You'd go for the potato. What's on that potato? Butter. Is butter dairy? Yes, butter is dairy. So no butter and no sour cream on your potato. You could do salt and pepper. You can do margarine, which is a trans fat. So I don't want you to use a lot of margarine, but actually um, potatoes aren't that good for you anyway. And ideally you're not gonna eat a potato. Why? Well, because we want you on a low carb diet. Well, this is 2.0, right? This is after you have figured out all of those other things. Now I want you to start working yourself onto a low carb diet. Why? Remember I told you about high fructose corn syrup and I told you that when you spike your blood sugar, it increases inflammation in the brain? Well, potatoes are one of those things that are gonna spike your blood sugar. So you're probably going to eliminate them altogether. If you would, if you're like, oh my gosh, potatoes are my, my comfort food. That's what I go to. Okay. There's been a study that was done that showed that if you cook the potato, refrigerate it, and then reheat it up, you lower its glycemic index. You lower its ability to spike your blood sugar. So you could eat a potato, but you're going to cook it the day before, throw it in the refrigerator overnight, let it cool down, get rid of all those extra carbs, and then reheat it. So we want to go for lower carbs. And that's one of those strategies that will lower the carb content of your potato. So we started to talk about whole diets last year. And I do want to bring back this concept of whole diets. The ketogenic diet is a low carb, high fat diet. It's a diet that is typically 80% fat, 15% protein and 5% carb. Let's say that you decide I'm gonna try the ketogenic diet. Wonderful, that would be a good strategy for you. That being said, you don't have to be 100% compliant to a ketogenic diet. If you just cut down your carbs and increase your protein and fat, then you're kind of in an Atkins keto meld. 
that will work. That will bring down your blood sugar and it will bring down your inflammation. And we're starting to see that work in people with autoimmunity, people with Parkinson's, people with Alzheimer's. This idea of lowering the carb content of your diet, highly effective for reducing inflammation. A vegetarian diet works for some people with Parkinson's as well. That's because of those 30 plant-based foods. If you go vegetarian, for sure you're getting those 30 plant-based foods, but you can get 30 plant-based foods on a ketogenic diet. And you might think, well, how am I going to do that? Plant-based foods aren't high fat. No, they're not. But fiber actually gets to be subtracted from carbohydrates when you go keto. So you actually can still eat vegetables. You just eat lower carb vegetables. Which brings us to the anti-inflammatory diet. The anti-inflammatory diet is a diet that eliminates sugar and red meat and some of the things that are more inflammatory. And if you're eliminating inflammatory things, then you're reducing inflammation. So you're able to reduce the inflammation that is happening in the brain. And that's another thing worth considering. And then lastly, the Mediterranean diet is always a good go-to diet. If you're thinking, well, you know, I'm not willing to go keto because I don't want to be limited in the restaurants I can go to or something like that, then think about going Mediterranean and think about including things like olive oil and making sure you get lots of fresh vegetables and focus on fish as your source of protein. This is one of the big questions I get all the time from people with Parkinson's and people with autoimmune disease. They want to know if they should eliminate wheat. What do you think? Do you want good news or bad news? So the good news is when they look at people with Parkinson's, there is a percentage of them that react to wheat, but it's a low percentage. It's probably like 20% of women with Parkinson's that are reacting with, to wheat. When people eliminate wheat, they see a reduction in their tremor. So if you're someone who has a big tremor, eliminating wheat might help your tremor. The reason is that we see on a very regular basis that a lot of people with Parkinson's also have celiac disease. It's often undiagnosed. And if you don't know whether you have celiac, but you're concerned, talk to your physician and there's a very easy test that they can run. The other thing that wheat does, especially when it's been processed into wheat, does that look like wheat? No, that looks like processed food, right? Well, when it's processed into bread, it spikes your blood sugar. So could you have one piece of toast for breakfast? Yes, absolutely. That's not going to kill you. But if you're eating wheat at every meal, you should probably be cutting back because your blood sugar is spiking and that spiking of your blood sugar is increasing neuroinflammation. As I mentioned, we're seeing that among people with Parkinson's, wheat sensitivity is more common in women. Don't know why, but that's what we see. And then lastly, the way that we process wheat in the United States, and I saw there was someone on here from the UK, so this isn't true for you. In, in the United States, we harvest the wheat and then we spray it with pesticides so that we don't get all of the little wheat varmints in there, right? There's all those little bugs that like to infest our wheat. And if you're a baker, you know what I'm talking about, those little flies that show up in your flour. Well, the way that they've been trying to get rid of those little flies in your flour is that they spray the wheat with pesticide before they process it into flour, which means there's no rain washing the pesticide off the wheat. You're getting all of the pesticide when you get wheat. So if you're trying to do a low chemical diet, you don't want to eat wheat. It's got a lot of pesticide in it. Now, in other countries, they are not using pesticides on their wheat. So we find that people who are sensitive to wheat in the United States can go to France and Italy and eat as much, you know, croissants as they want. 
with no reaction whatsoever. So it does make a difference that we are doing this as a process in the US. I told you we want you to eat fish oil or omega-3. So we're gonna jump into talking about some supplements now. If you are uh, taking fish oil and fish oil has been shown to reduce inflammation, the big thing to notice is that we want a cold water fish. And most of the fish oil that you can buy in the United States is coming off the coast of Argentina or someplace else in South America. Really, we're looking for cold water fish. That's the fish that make the good oils. So we're looking for stuff that's coming from Norway and Sweden and Finland. And Nordic Naturals is a good brand of fish oil because it's a cold water fish. Now, there was a study that just came out this last year that showed that fish protein is even better than fish oil because it turns out in people with Parkinson's, the fish protein is blocking alpha synuclein from folding incorrectly. So making sure you're getting fish in your diet at least two times a week, maybe even three or four times a week, really good for you. If you are one of those people who burps fish oil, but you still want to get those healthy oils, omega-3 fatty acids are your solution. Now, what you'll find if you go to the grocery store and you go to buy omega-3 fatty acids is that they're usually sell selling them in 1,000 mil caps. And those 1,000 mil caps are super big. They're like horse pills. I'm not a good person for swallowing those super large caps, but that's all they have. 1,000 units a day is not enough. If you're trying to block inflammation, you need at least 3,000 milligrams per day of omega-3s. So look at the dosage. Um, I will tell you, because my husband bought them, they do make capsules that have 2,000 milligrams in them, and they're enormous. They're so big. He doesn't have any problem swallowing capsules. I do. I have to buy the 1,000 and then take three. He buys the 2,000 and takes two. So can you overdose on fish oil? You can, but you would have to take more than 10,000 units a day of omega-3s to overdose. So 3,000 is not going to hurt you. And it's going to be good for you. Most of the studies that are done on omega-3s for reducing inflammation also suggest that you take vitamin E. And they suggest you're taking 400 IU. IU stands for international unit. So you'll either see things in milligrams or IUs. IU international unit. Okay. The next thing is vitamin D. And I briefly mentioned vitamin D last year, but I'm gonna tell you about it again, because one of the things that we've learned since COVID started is that the vast majority of people do not have enough vitamin D. You need to be taking a minimum, minimum of 3000 IUs a day. What we're seeing in people who are older than 60 is that they're probably needing closer to 5,000 IUs per day. and for people who got COVID, just so you know, like where you are on the spectrum, people who got COVID, they were giving them 100,000 IUs of vitamin D when they would get come into the hospital. So you're not in a place where you're going to overdose with vitamin D. We can give you 100,000 units. I'm telling you a daily dose that's going to make your gut happy. And your gut's going to be happy with a minimum of 3,000 units a day. Now, in order for vitamin D to be absorbed, you also have to make sure that you've got magnesium. And usually we thought people were getting enough magnesium in their diet. But one of the things that COVID taught us is that the vast majority of Americans are also magnesium deficient. So check whether or not you have a multivitamin that has magnesium in it. If you do not take any multivitamin and you are not taking any supplements, likely you are one of those magnesium deficient people. You should be getting about 400 milligrams per day of magnesium. The form of magnesium that are out there, there are many forms out there. I prefer magnesium glycinate because I'm one of those people who if I take too much magnesium, I get diarrhea. 
but we know that people with Parkinson's tend to be constipated. Taking magnesium daily will also help with your constipation. And I can't remember what other vitamin I put here and I can't see you. So I'm going to move this. Oh, vitamin K. Vitamin K is a vitamin that requires vitamin D to be absorbed. So whereas vitamin D requires magnesium, whoa, vitamin K requires vitamin D. So a lot of the supplements that you will find out there with vitamin D also have vitamin K in them. So if you're taking a vitamin D, vitamin K supplement, see if it also has magnesium in there. If it doesn't, take magnesium as well. I personally like a magnesium gummy. Um, it is uh, a little gummy made by, um, well, it's called Calm, and I think it's made by uh, Vitality. CoQ10. I mentioned CoQ10 last time. Um, there's more research out now on CoQ10 as well. And what we're seeing for people with Parkinson's is that the range of CoQ10 doses are from 600 to 1200 milligrams per day. There are other forms of CoQ10 out there, and one of them is called ubiquinol. If you're taking ubiquinol, you can go to the lower end. You can go to 600 milligrams. And in fact, you can even go to 300 milligrams per day. And I checked this weekend just to make sure Costco has a ubiquinol made by Nature's Made that is 300 milligrams per day that is affordable because CoQ10 can actually um, be very expensive. Uh, so, you know, I don't want you to have an expensive form. Um, but what you're doing with CoQ10 is you're reducing disease progression because you're reducing inflammation. You may or may not notice a difference in your symptoms, but what we're seeing is the people who took CoQ10 between 600 and 1200 milligrams per day over three years had much slower disease progression than those who weren't taking CoQ10. So I'm thinking right now with CoQ10 with disease progression. Vitamin B12 and folate. We're seeing that people with Parkinson's tend to have a B12 deficiency. And that's one of the things that's causing neuropathy. We also see that vitamin B12 can cause cognitive decline. So B12 plus folate, folate is vitamin B9, although we usually call it uh, folate, um, are something that I would add if I were you. And I take a B vitamin supplement every day as well. Folate is actually really good for your memory. So be between B12 and folate, you start noticing that you can remember where you put your car keys again. Because I don't know about you, but that's that memory gene is starting to go away for me. Glutathione. Glutathione is a antioxidant and we make it in our body, but it turns out we're probably not making enough probably has to do with the quality of protein that we're eating. If we're eating really high quality protein, like you know the farmer who grew the cow, et cetera, you might be getting enough glutathione, glycine to give you glutathione, but otherwise you're probably not. And so oral glutathione is what's recommended. The studies showed that 300 milligrams per day had no effect. You have to take it up to 600 milligrams per day. And some people are finding that IV glutathione, where literally you go to a clinic and they hook you up to an IV bag and they put glutathione into your system at 1400 milligrams per day is slowing disease progression. So again, it requires going to a clinic, but it might be beneficial if it's something that um, you're interested in is getting your antioxidants, which will kill off all those reactive oxygen species, get those much higher with IV glutathione. N-acetylcysteine is one of the precursors to glutathione, NAC. And you might've heard of it during the pandemic as well, because 
um, people were using it for their lung health because it turns out it reduces the damage to the lungs if you get COVID. And people were using it at such a high rate because everybody noticed that it worked early on that the FDA actually put limitations on it during COVID. But they have uh, removed the limitations now and you can buy NAC at the grocery store now. And again, NAC is, I'm thinking long-term, glutathione is today. So the long-term health aspect, you take NAC on a regular basis. Glutathione is, man, I seem to be having a flare. I need something to work absolutely right now today. Melatonin. Many of us take melatonin to sleep. It's an antioxidant, so it is also going to reduce inflammation, but it's also been shown to be neuroprotective. And interestingly, there's data showing that people with Parkinson's may have as much as 50 times less melatonin than someone else your age. That's frightening, right? How come your melatonin is not being made? Well, again, it goes back to those healthy gut microbes. It turns out what's making the melatonin is happening in your gut and then it goes to your brain. And so if your gut is unhappy, so is your brain. Now, melatonin is usually made as you're starting to go to sleep. But usually what happens with people with Parkinson's is that they can't stay asleep through the night. So there are versions of time release melatonin that you can take and they will it'll release over the course of the night so that you sleep all night long. That being said, some folks who have taken the time release melatonin notice that they have a little bit of a melatonin hangover the next morning. So you want to be careful if you need to be awake and alert the next morning, then you may not want the time release melatonin. You may just want to take melatonin before you go to bed. The appropriate dose, and I'm telling you this because, again, during the pandemic, we saw people taking as much as 50 milligrams of melatonin five milligrams of melatonin should put you to sleep. You shouldn't need 50. Now, because you make less than other people your age, you may need to increase it to 10. You may even go as high as 20. Once you get to 50, you may start interfering with other medications. And so I just want to warn you on that, that melatonin could interfere with your other medications if you take very high doses. If you only are taking a five milligram dose, um, the only medication it's been shown to interfere with is if you're taking medication for restless leg syndrome. So restless leg syndrome medications may have, uh, may react with melatonin. All right, we talked about herbs. The spices are the herbs that you could get as a capsule. So you can take cinnamon as a capsule. I've actually been taking cinnamon as, as a capsule this year for my blood sugar. And I've noticed that my blood sugar has come down since I started taking cinnamon. So cinnamon is a really good um, herb for blood glucose. And we know that it helps people with Parkinson's. Many people with Parkinson's take curcumin, again, reduces inflammation. And matcha, you can get either as a tea or you can get it as a capsule. But this is like, you don't like drinking green tea? Fine, take green tea as a capsule. You can buy it as a capsule as well. There's an herb out there. Well, there's a component from an herb out there that is starting to show a lot of promise for people with Parkinson's. This herb has also now entered the drug development pipeline. It's called berberine, and it is the orange color that occurs in golden seal and Oregon grape root. Berberine has been shown to lower blood sugar. It's been shown to prevent dopaminergic loss, meaning it's going to prevent those neurons in your brain from breaking down, and it's been shown to reduce neuroinflammation. So if I were going to make a recommendation for you about something new this year that you could try, berberine seems like a go-to thing. Um, berberine is being studied at doses from 500 to 1,000 milligrams per day. It's also been shown to help cholesterol levels. So lots of different health benefits with berberine. 
I personally like the brand Oregon's Wild Harvest, but depending on where you are in the country, you may or may not be able to get that brand. Um, I like Pure Encapsulations. I like Thorn. There's a few different brands out there that are high quality berberine brands. The other herbs that you might consider are adaptogenic herbs. These are ginger, ginseng, and rhodiola. They're all roots, which mean they taste terrible. But if you buy a capsule, you don't have to it, you don't have to experience the flavor. And all of these three herbs have been shown to reduce neuroinflammation and help with fatigue. So if you're someone who starts feeling fatigued in the middle of the day, rhodiola and ginseng gives you that lift without caffeine. So it doesn't make you have to pee more because that's always a concern, right? Having to run to the bathroom. Rhodiola and ginseng may actually reduce the neuroinflammation and help with the fatigue. Ginger has also been shown to help with digestion as well as neuroinflammation. So with all of these things together, I realized that this tends to be a lot of information. So I thought what I would do is I just show you what a sample diet might look like. So here's an example for breakfast. One possibility is if you're um, one of those folks who wants to get some protein in your breakfast, you're going to space it away from your L-DOPA, right? So either um, have it two hours before you take L-DOPA or 30 minutes after you take L-DOPA. Two eggs, vegetable hash. My vegetable hash that I make has caramelized onion, mushroom, tomato, artichoke, lentils, and then a bunch of spices like basil and thyme and oregano. I get 10 different plant-based foods for breakfast, just for breakfast, one day. I've, half, I've got half my week covered right there. So vegetable hash, I usually throw some a slice of avocado on top here, or you could do organic oatmeal with some alternative milk. I use coconut milk, but other people like hemp milk, oat milk, any sort of non-dairy milk that's organic, and some berries, because we want to get those berries into our diet, or some alternative milk yogurt. I like coconut yogurt. Um, cashew yogurt, so delicious. Oh my goodness. If you haven't tried cashew yogurt, you should try it. It's like dessert. And then berries and nuts. For lunch, we could do a chicken salad made with celery and onions. So again, we're getting some more plant-based foods in there. And then I like to take my chicken salad and throw some cashews and craisins on there. So now I've got four plant-based foods on my chicken salad. Or you could do soup and salad with fish, four or five different vegetables, and a low-carb dressing with olive oil. And I made sure I mentioned low-carb because a lot of salad dressings are loaded with sugar. So if you're trying to control the blood sugar, we're going to try to go for a low-carb dressing. Or you could do tacos. And I'm thinking tacos with the hard shell tortillas. Um, if I'm going to eat a, a wheat tortilla, then I want to go organic, right? Um, vegetables, beans, avocado, no dairy in my taco, but I guarantee you I make a darn good taco without any dairy. Dinner, steak, roasted vegetables, and then to get some more vegetables in there, if you've never tried chimichurri, it's just herbs, it's herbs and olive oil, and that gets you a bunch more vegetables right there. You could do a curry. This has been one of my favorite things lately. I've been doing all sorts of different curries, Thai curries, Indian curries, biryanis, all sorts of them. But make them with coconut milk, because remember, coconut is highly anti-inflammatory. Vegetables, shrimp, cauliflower rice. You can do enchiladas with your low-carb organic tortillas. Fill them with veggies and chicken and use a green chili sauce. So all of these sorts of things to get more plant-based foods into your diet. And then for snacks, for snacks, I'm thinking things like a handful of nuts or some berries. Go fresh, not dried, because the dried berries will spike your blood sugar. Fresh berries won't. 
yogurt, non-dairy. Um, I've been making peanut butter balls lately. I use organic Adams, no sugar peanut butter or almond butter. And then I throw in some coconut flour and some mini dark chocolate chips. Carrots and celery, always a good snack. If you're gonna eat bars, try to do the whole food bars. So like Be Kind bars or RX bars, you're looking for something that's a whole grain and that's low sugar. And when I say low sugar, low carb, if you read the label on the bar, it should be less than 10 carbs in a, in a single bar. What you'll find with a lot of the bars that are out there is that they have up to 23 carbs in a single bar. For people who are truly on a low carb diet, you want a total of 30 carbs all day. So one bar, you've wiped out all of your carbs for the day. Come on. So my final food thoughts are that there was one diet that was shown to be even better than the 30 plant-based foods diet. And you can probably tell by looking at this slide what it is. It's fermented foods. I don't like fermented foods. I will be honest. I like yogurt, but I am not a fan of kimchi and sauerkraut and all of those things. But it turns out that our gut microbes love fermented foods. And what that study showed was that if you could get three fermented foods per week, you were healthier than people who had only 30 plant-based foods per week. So it turns out that the fermented foods are even better. So eat those pickles, eat that kombucha. Um, but again, you're looking for low sugar fermented foods. And and I guess the other thing I just want to say is that food does make a difference. Like we're seeing it left and right in people with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's that food does make a difference. So to summarize, I want you to get 30 plant-based organic whole foods and three fermented foods weekly. I'd like you to go as low carb as you feel comfortable and I want you to eat fresh or frozen vegetables, not canned. The more colorful those foods are, the better. And try to get some fish into your diet because it's blocking the misfolding of alpha-synuclein. And daily, think about these supplements, omega-3s or fish oil, CoQ10, vitamin D, magnesium, vitamin K, B12, folate, we talked about B6 last time. Remember that most Parkinson's medications deplete B6. So if you're on any medication at all, you want to be on B6. Glutathione or NAC and berberine. Every time you eat is an opportunity to nourish your body. So eat wisely. And then the last thing I want to do is I just wanted to let you know that we are starting to do some research for people with Parkinson's. And if you want to be part of a nutritional focus, so we're looking at supplements um, for people with Parkinson's, you can email my colleague Piper at Thena.com and we'll add you to a database. And when we have those studies ready to go, we will email you and see if you want to be part of the study. Okay, I am ready to take some questions. Okay, good, because we have a lot of questions. <laughs> so some of these, because we are on limited time and I have a ton of questions, I'm going to just go through real quick because they kind of just seem to be pretty quick. Um, people were kind of asking, how, for example, how about black tea instead of green tea? Green tea has a stronger antioxidant component than black tea, but black tea is not unhealthy. It's just not as healthy as green tea. What about organic butter or plant-based butter? Organic butter is healthier. Um, the plant-based butter is non-dairy and that's the best. Um, the organic butter still blocks uric acid production. And so it's still not great. Um, but there has been a study showing that you could do as much as four ounces, which is like two butter packets of organic butter. And then someone did ask, is the uric acid you speak of the same that causes gout? 
It is. It's the same uric acid. So uric acid, if you make too much of it, will cause gout. And if you make too little of it, it contributes to Parkinson's. And then some people ask, do we have to give up the sweet potatoes and the yams? Do the same thing that I recommended you do with the potato. Cook it ahead, put it in the refrigerator, and reheat it. And you'll lower the glycemic index of the sweet potato and the yams. And somebody asked about the Ezekiel sprouted grain bread. Is that better? It's better um, because it's a whole grain. So it is way, and it's also organic. So if you want to do the Ezekiel sprouted grain bread, I, I definitely would encourage that over any other type of bread in the United oh. States. And is popcorn a wheat I should limit intake? Popcorn is a corn. Um, should you limit intake? Well, I don't know about you, but my popcorn has either butter on it or it's kettle corn, which is coated in sugar. So popcorn dry, no problem. Popcorn with salt, no problem. Popcorn coated with butter or sugar, that's a problem. And what about tofu made by soybean? Tofu, uh, I'm glad you asked that. Tofu, if you're buying it organic, is great. If you're not buying it organic, it is another one of those high pesticide foods. So be careful. Soy is actually one of the higher pesticide foods that we have in our, um, our grocery stores. And is krill oil as good as fish oil? Krill oil is as good as fish oil. You can use krill oil. Again, you want to make sure you're getting it from a cold water location. And then what about like canned tuna or canned salmon? Are those no good or are those? They, I don't know if you've noticed, but in the grocery store, they have started selling salmon and tuna in packets instead of cans. And that is why, because we know the cans are no good. So if you can use up the cans you've got and then switch to the packets, the packets are way better for you. They don't have the dangerous lining. And how about omega-3 and chia seeds, cotton seeds, et cetera, are they equal to fish oil? The omega-3s are actually a component of fish oil. And so, yes, they are equal to fish oil and could actually be better. The flax seed and chia seed don't have all of the essential oil components. They have most of them, though. So if you're going between nothing and flax or chia seed, I say, yeah, go for the flax and chia seed. If you have the opportunity to get some omega-3s in there that are concentrated, that's even better. And then I guess you had in the Mediterranean diet, you showed some tomatoes. Aren't they pro-inflammation? That is a good question and it's a trick question. Tomatoes are pro-inflammation for people with arthritis. They are anti-inflammation for people with Parkinson's. So if you have both, don't eat the tomatoes. But if you have Parkinson's, tomatoes are actually protective. Um, nightshades, all the nightshades are protective for Parkinson's, but they're pro-inflammatory for arthritis. And then someone asked, how do you know if the inflammation is lowered? You're taking all these steps. How do you know if it gets lowered? Oh, that's a great question. Um, usually what you'll experience is less fatigue less anxiety, less depression, you'll feel more energetic, you'll experience less pain. So most people know that their inflammation is going away because all of the symptoms that are so annoying <laughs> are, are actually improving. And somebody asked that the supplements aren't those processed as well, because those aren't food. Yeah, the supplements are processed. It's true. And, you know, I have stayed away for the last five years. I've been doing talks on food for Parkinson's and I've been staying away from talking about supplements. But a group of folks with Parkinson's that I work with finally said, you know, we're all taking supplements. So you might as well tell us which ones are the good ones for us to take and which ones we should stay away from. So I did some research to make sure I knew which supplements were good. But what I will tell you is that the quality matters. There are some unethical people out there who make 
supplements that are not pure. We want to make sure that you're getting stuff that is pure with no heavy metals. So um, make sure if you're buying a supplement, you're looking for something that is third party tested. You're looking for third party tested, and then they'll make sure that there's nothing in there that's dangerous. And quick, someone asked, because you, you had in the sample, are eggs dairy? Does that count as dairy or is that just protein for breakfast? Oh, eggs are just protein. And again, organic is better. Remember that when a chicken or a cow or any animal eats a pesticide, any of the pesticides are going to get concentrated in the fat. So if you're using eggs that are not organic, then the yolk is going to contain all the pesticide. If you're just eating egg whites, that's not a problem. If you're eating the yolks, then you're getting pesticides in non-organic eggs. Same is true with bacon, right? I love me some bacon, but I make sure I buy or organic bacon so I don't get any pesticides. And this is an interesting question. What would be a good gum for chewing to control drooling because all gums seem to contain artificial sweeteners? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I, I honestly, I don't, I don't know the answer. You're right. They do all contain artificial sweeteners. I don't know the answer to that. I don't chew gum. <laughs> um, is ginseng recommended for folks who have anxiety or panic disorders? No. If you are already anxious or panicky, then I would switch the herb from ginseng and rhodiola to ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is an adaptogenic herb that will help control anxiety. The other one that I really like is lemon balm, which is also called Melissa officinalis. It mm -hmm. also helps control anxiety. Okay. Um, Someone asked, I thought studies showed that there was no evidence that CoQ10 had any effect on Parkinson's symptoms. There are 12 studies out there now. Um, the systematic review that showed no evidence for CoQ10 um, came out when there were six studies out. And um, the systematic review combined all of the 300 milligrams uh, studies with the data, which brought all of the effect sizes down. So if you actually use a high enough dose, then we're starting to see effects in people with Parkinson's. But if you use a low dose, then there's no effect at all. Then there's no point in buying it. And someone asks, if one, if someone takes NAC, do you also have to take glutathione? And someone else asked, what was NAC again? <laughs> NAC, it, it's a difficult one to spell, but I'll spell it out for you. It's N-acetyl, A-C-E-T-Y-L, N-acetylcholine, C-H-O-L-I-N-E, okay? N-acetylcholine, and it is the precursor for glutathione. So if you take NAC, you don't need to take glutathione. It is what your body needs to make its own glutathione. I'm still trying to go through. I'm like, no go through real quick, all of the, um, um, someone asked about what about the mind diet, M-I-N-D diet? Yeah, it's a good diet. It's just that it doesn't eliminate all the dairy. And so if you don't have Parkinson's, do you need to eliminate dairy? Some people would say yes. Uh, I was just watching Woody Harrelson on TV this week and he was like, dairy, get rid of it. Um, but, you know, do you need dairy or do you not eat dairy or are we a victim of good advertising? Um, you, you probably don't need dairy. It's better to take a calcium supplement than it is to get all the pesticides that are in the dairy. Mm -hmm. And someone asked, do you, are all the beans that you cook or do they start off dried? Is that how you cook your beans? Uh, you have to soak them, right? I, I don't start them off dry. I start them off soaked. Um, and I will be the first to admit that if I'm in a pinch, I do buy organic canned beans. So I, that is my one food that I still go back to can sometimes because sometimes I don't, I don't plan enough to soak my beans the night before. Um, 
how do you test to see if a person with Parkinson's has less melatonin? I don't know if you do that clinically. Mm -hmm. um, in the lab, we do a blood draw um, and the studies that have been done, they actually measure it in cerebral spinal fluid. So they do a spinal tap um, so that you actually know how much is reaching the brain. But um, I don't know if they're measuring melatonin clinically. Uh, I only know how to do it from a research perspective. And I have a question about both plant-based cheese and organic cheese. Okay. Um, plant-based cheese is often cheese made from cashews um, and it is organic and it is more expensive, but it is better for you. You can, and, and if you haven't tried it, it actually is quite good. I made a lasagna using only plant-based cheese. And then for noodles, I use zucchini um, and I just slice it really thin and it's amazing. I have to say, and my family, even, even my meat eater family loves that lasagna. So plant-based cheese, good. Organic cheese still has the problem of breaking down uric acid. It doesn't have the pesticides, so you don't have to worry about that. The problem is that it breaks down uric acid. Now, we know uric acid is so protective for Parkinson's that they are there is a drug on the market that is starting to be used in people with Parkinson's. It was originally used in people with diabetes because it also stabilizes your blood sugar, but it is also now being used in people with Parkinson's. So if you're taking that medication, then there's less reason to worry about dairy. But if you're not on that medication, um, you still still want to worry about it being organic. But if you're not on that medication, then you are breaking down the uric acid. So, and you're not getting it exogenously. And I don't remember what it's called. I'm sorry, but you can probably Google it and you'll find the name of that medication. And then do any of these supplements cause loose stool or diarrhea? Magnesium. Magnesium can cause loose stool or diarrhea if you get too much or if you get the wrong form. So um, just pay attention to the form of the magnesium that you're getting. I recommended glycinate because in my experience, and I'm very diarrhea prone, glycinate does not cause diarrhea in me, but all the other forms of magnesium do for me. So it depends on... Um, the way that your body is absorbing magnesium. And then somebody did also address, um, which is in the chat, um, that there was a gum that was recommended that they were told was, was good. Um, a couple of people have asked about probiotics. Yeah, so I didn't address probiotics. Um, that's because it's in a really weird place right now. So a study came out in 2018 that showed that people with Parkinson's in four different locations in the United States had an overabundance of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And it looks like the medication, um, the L-DOPA, uh, which is carbidopa or levodopa carbidopa, is causing lactobacillus and bifidobacterium to grow in your gut. And so for those people who are on levodopa carbidopa, you don't need a probiotic. All the probiotics are, are lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, the vast majority of them. So um, they are already there. If you are not on levodopa carbidopa, then taking a probiotic that is those microbes may actually be helpful. The other thing that that particular study showed was that there is a reduction of the microbes in the gut for people with Parkinson's, um, the microbes that make a particular type of um, compound called short chain fatty acids. And guess what? Plant-based foods are how you get those microbes. And people with Parkinson's in that study were missing 10 10 different species of microbes because they weren't getting enough plant-based foods. So if you do it with food, you don't need the probiotic. If you are not doing it with food, then it's possible you would need a probiotic. But the problem is the probiotics that we have, the vast majority of them are these two strains of microbes, 
lactobacillus and by phytobacterium. There are some probiotics out that have a bacillus strain in them. I know I feel like I'm getting a whole nother lecture right now because this is, I teach this, right? I teach this in medical school. So um, I don't want to confuse you, but the short answer is at this point, your medication probably is giving you the microbes that you would get in a probiotic. Well, we are, we've already gone over. Um, someone did put a joke in that some of these questions could be safe for 3.0 next year. But <laughs> thank you so much for your time. This has been incredible and so informative. As always at um, PMD Alliance, we have our tradition, our wave of gratitude. And we're so happy that you could be with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, you all, and good luck on your nutritional journey. And of course, this will be available tomorrow as well as the um, slides. So thank you everybody for joining us.